Hey, Internet, it's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. And today's topic is actually suggested by commenter LP. Recently, it did a video about the origin of the tribes of elves. And LP asked for a similar origin story uh, for humans, the tribes of men. Uh, so, LP, here is your requested video. To start us off on this story of the tribes of men, I'm going to start with something that's actually not canon. This is a work that Tolkien wrote before writing The Silmarillion. It's called Gilfenan's Tale, and it's an unfinished story uh, that his son Christopher published. I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One, it's kind of an interesting little piece of lore that you may not have heard, but also it shows uh, the origin of his mindset for how humanity would grow in his world. Uh, there are definite connections between what this kind of almost say like a first draft of the origins of men uh, versus the version that's in the Silmarillion. So, in Gilfannon's tale, uh, Gilfannon is an elf. He's one of the oldest elves that lives on Tol Erisea. Uh, that is the island that's just off the coast of Amman. You can look out at Valinor. Uh, he lives in a place called the House of the Hundred Chimneys. And he's telling a story about uh, the origin of the children of Iluvatar. Specifically, uh, men. In Gilfannon's tale, uh, we have the Dark Elves. They're also going to appear, obviously, in the Silmarillion. But here we've got, particularly, a Dark Elf named Nuin. Nuin likes to journey, likes to travel around, um, kind of explore. And in his exploring, he finds this kind of hidden valley around, uh, enclosed by these encircling mountains. Uh, the valley is called the Vale of Sleep, Mermenalda. And it's beautiful. It's evocative, actually, of what Valinor would be. Uh, now, obviously, Nuin wouldn't know what that is because the Dark Elves are named the Dark Elves because they have not seen the light of Valinor. They never went to the west. But... To, a, uh, to Gilfannon, I guess, <laughs> one who has seen Valinor, this particular site is, is very striking in its beauty. Um, also, uh, the valley is just covered with sleeping figures. Nguyen is taken by the beauty of this place and also puzzled by these sleeping figures on the ground. He is warned by his leader, the leader of the Dark Elves, to uh, just leave him alone. You know, um, they're not ripe yet. No, uh, basically, uh, Tu says uh, they need the sun. We're, they're waiting for the sun to rise. The sun at this point has not come up for the first time. And so Nguyen is warned, don't wake them up too early. But Nguyen still keeps going and basically sits and watches them as, as they sleep and enjoys the surroundings. And at some point, he accidentally stumbles over some of the sleeping figures and wakes them up. There are two men, Erman and Elmir, uh, and they are awakened. And, uh, you know, the, the sun hasn't come up yet. The sun comes up shortly thereafter, so they, they beat the sun by a, a bit. But they are basically awakened early. Uh, they do not have uh, their own language at this point. They're, they're speechless. And so it's Nguyen who ends up teaching them language. He becomes known as the father of speech. And so there's obviously a very close relationship here between the Dark Elves and uh, humanity in this particular version, Gilfannon's Tale. Later in Gilfannon's Tale, uh, Nguyen actually fights alongside Elmir and Ermon against Fangli. Fangli is the name of the character that gets replaced by Sauron in the Silmarillion. But um, essentially, here's this dark elf fighting with the tribes of men against Sauron, essentially. Uh, for his efforts, unfortunately, Nguyen is killed off by goblins in that moment. But uh, that's about as far as the tale goes. But you can see there, so we've got a situation where this dark elf finds these sleeping humans uh, way off. Uh, 
in the East, uh, awakens them, uh, teaches them language, and has some kind of a, a simpatico with them. So now we come to the Silmarillion. And obviously, you know, Fang Li and some of these other names, uh, Elmir and Erman disappear. But there are some certain similarities uh, between Gilfannon's tale and the Silmarillion. But in this case, in Silmarillion, men awaken in uh, the Valley of Hildorian. And I'm going to read you the excerpt from the Silmarillion here. Uh, it's actually humorous. You're going to see a lot of nicknames that the elves have for humans. And you tell me if you think maybe they're not like a little annoyed by these other children of Iluvatar coming around. Okay. At the first rising of the sun, the younger children of Iluvatar awoke in the land of Hildorian, in the eastward regions of Middle-earth. But the first sun arose in the west, and the opening eyes of men were turned towards it, and their feet, as they wandered over the earth, for the most part, strayed that way. The Atani they were named by the Eldar, the second people. But they called them also Hildor, the followers, and many other names. Apanonar, the afterborn, Engvar, the sickly, and Firamar, the mortals. And they named them the usurpers, the strangers, and the inscrutable, the self-cursed, the heavy-handed, the night-fearers, the children of the sun. So, <laughs> most of those names, uh, maybe children of the sun, uh, sounds reasonable, although they're, they're saying is, hey, you had to wait till the sun came up till you guys showed up. We were here long ago. Um, but, you know, the self-cursed, the night fears, the heavy-handed, there's a whole bunch of, uh, I would say, negative connotation nicknames that the elves give to uh, their new neighbors. Uh, so I think that gives you an idea for perhaps a relationship there between them. Humans are now awake, way in the east, as I say, in Hildorian. Uh, the Valar are not there. The Valar are still back in Valinor. Uh, it's Morgoth who shows up and teaches them fear. I, I've done a, a video on the gift of men, which is basically the gift of death, to be able to pass on from this world. Uh, Morgoth teaches humanity that that's actually something to fear, that it's the doom of men. Um, and so, you know, he corrupts. Uh, and, and in the absence of any other, you know, godlike figures, most of humanity decides to follow Morgoth, and he takes them on. So I'm going to read you here another passage from the Silmarillion. Uh, humanity has woken up uh, and are choosing their way in life. Of men, little is told in these tales which concern the eldest days before the waxing of mortals and the waning of the elves, save of those fathers of men, the Atanatari, who in the first years of the sun and moon wandered into the north of the world. To Hildorian there came no Vala to guide men or to summon them to dwell in Valinor, and men have feared the Valar rather than loved them, and have not understood the purposes of the powers being at variance with them and at strife with the world. Yet it is told that ere long they met dark elves in many places and were befriended by them, and men became the companions and disciples in their childhood of these ancient folk, wanderers of the elven race who never set out upon the paths to Valinor and knew of the Valar only as a rumor and a distant name. So there you go connection back to Gilfannon's tale. Uh, our early humans meet up with the Dark Elves, befriend them, are probably taught things like language and such by the Dark Elves. And so there's a friendship that goes on there. But what you see is, with Morgoth's influence, uh, you see some fractures happen. There's a, there's a portion of humanity that is uh, opposed to Morgoth. Uh, and so they're basically at war with each other, like a civil war, practically, among men. So certain tribes journey west to get away from the strife that's happening here in the east. Um, they cross the mountains, they go to Beleriand, and they run into new elves. 
and it's their relationship with these other elves, like the Noldor, for instance, that defines these tribes. So what you've got is three tribes go and mingle with the elves. And then there's the rest of humanity that stays behind, basically under Morgoth's thrall. So that's how we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about the three houses that went west, and then we'll talk about the rest uh, that did not go into the west. Okay, so these three houses. There's the first house, second house, third house. They're, they're numbered by when they actually crossed over and met the elves uh, in Beleriand. The first house is known as the House of Baor. It's one of the major champions of that house. So the House of Baor uh, first run into uh, the elven lord Finrod. Finrod is the brother of Galadriel. He is of the House of Finarfin. Um, he welcomes them in. They have a very strong friendship. And they are granted uh, the land of Darthonion eventually. That's where they eventually settle. The people of the House of Beor are, are dark-haired, stout. Uh, it would be more like the, the Noldor elves in their appearance. Um, one of the most famous heroes from that line uh, is Baron. Uh, the story of uh, Baron and Luthien. Baron is from the House of Beor. Beor himself lived to a ripe old age in 93. Died, as far as we can tell, a, a peaceful death. All was not to go well, though, for the House of Beor, and eventually they lost most of their house. But that's just, in a nutshell, House of Beor, first house. The people of the House of Haleth uh, were typically reclusive, also dark-haired, a little uh, smaller in stature than the folks of the House of Beor. As they migrated, when they hit the White Mountains, they ran into a tribe later known as the Druidine, the Drugs, and struck up a friendship. Um, and in fact, that alliance lasted for a long time. The, when the uh, House of Haleth continued to migrate, uh, there were several Druidine that went with them. And so they almost joined in with the house. Um, so at, they, they've met the Druidine. A faction of the House of Haleth decides to keep going. We're going to keep going west even though the going is difficult, some of the House of Haleth decide we've gone far enough. That group ends up becoming the Dunlendings. We'll talk about them when we're talking about the people that aren't associated with these three houses, but just put a pin in that. The Dunlendings were people from the House of Haleth that didn't journey on uh, when the time came. Okay, so the House of Haleth goes into the west, they do not meet up with the House of Finarfin. They instead become squatters. <laughs> they take up residence in Thargelion, and they're just like, yeah, we're fine. They don't really have permission to be where they are when they're hanging out. Well, Morgoth, this is still in the First Age, Morgoth uh, realizes that these men coming over to uh, the West could be a problem for him, so he decides to try to take care of them before they become a major issue. Sends an army of orcs. Army of orcs just about wipes them out. Puts them under siege. Kills off the leader of uh, the Haladin, uh, Haldad. Uh, and kills his son. There's basically, uh, it's his daughter is left to rally the troops. And that's Haleth, Lady Haleth. So it becomes the House of Haleth because of her heroism. I've done a video on Lady Haleth, so I won't go into in minute detail here. If you want to know more, uh, go check out that video. But she uh, keeps them together. They hold out as long as they can. They're about to get run over when one of the sons of Feanor, who basically, you know, that's part of Thargelion is part of his kingdom, uh, Caranthir, shows up, saves the day offers them a fiefdom. Hey, if you guys want to hang out and you can be under my rule, that'd be great. Uh, they're like, thanks, but no thanks. We're moving on. So they refuse Caranthir and keep migrating. Eventually, they end up in the forest of Brethil, uh, which is connected to the region of King Thingol. Um, and they are granted that land as long as they protect that border uh, that's kind of their 
their payment for accepting that land. And so they are connected with King Thingol, the Forest of Brethil. For a, some of these different wars that happen, they kind of stay away from them. As long as people aren't coming into their forest, they're not going to journey out too much to go fight. Um, and it's Lady Holith. Lady Holith actually lives also to a ripe old age. Uh, as far as I know, dies a peaceful death. She's one of the very few leaders of the House of Holith that actually doesn't die a terribly violent death. Um, so uh, good on her. She 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 held it together. She held the tribe together, um, and she really is the the mainstay of that house, the House of Holith. So the third tribe to journey west, the third house, is known as the House of Hador. It was originally led by a hero named Marak, but it was Hador uh, who, who came to epitomize this house, the house of Hador. So the people of the tribe of Hador uh, were tall, blonde. They resembled most uh, like the, the Vanyar elves. Uh, if you go back to my elven tribe video, I talk about the different tribes, the Noldor, the Vanyar, and such. So um, these were perhaps most like the Vanyar elves in appearance. They were discovered by the elven king Fingolfin, and they ended up settling in Fingolfin's land of Hithlum. That was surrounded by a mountain range uh, called the Mountains of Shadow. Uh, that's a good range. And the fiefdom that they were granted was called Dor Loman. This is where Hador was in his heyday. Eh, terrible pun. Anyway, um, he ruled for a long time until uh, the Battle of Sudden Flame, the Dagor Bregalach. I should mention that all three of these houses showed up during the time when the Siege of Angband was in place. So it was a peaceful time where the elves had Morgoth essentially at bay, although he did have these roving bands of orcs at his disposal, but... Morgoth himself was trapped in Angband for a long time, and it was during that time that these houses showed up. Well, suddenly one day, I believe it was 455 of the First Age, I've mentioned this before, but Dagger Bragalach, Battle of Sudden Flame, boom! I, it breaks out in style, and uh, a whole bunch of folks die. One of the people that dies, Hador, the lord of this third house, the house of Hador. Notably, because the elves... Uh, respected him so much, they gave him a gift of a helm that had been crafted by the dwarves and reportedly had magical powers to keep you from being harmed. Um, it was called the Dragon Helm of Dor Loman. And he wore it and he gave it to his son. Um, and eventually that helm uh, was passed down to the hero Turin Turambar. Uh, and it's the helm that he wore. Um, but uh, that is the house of Hador. So I mentioned the Druidine. They were the ones that uh, combined with the house of Halath. They're almost like a fourth tribe. They, as I mentioned, they were in the forest of Brethel with uh, the house of Halath. Um, and descendants of theirs, far removed descendants of theirs, were in the Third Age in the War of the Ring. Um, they helped uh, the Rohirrim, the Riders of Rohan, they basically were pivotal in getting them to Minas Tirith on time to fight uh, the Battle of Pelennor Fields. That was their leader, Gon Barry Gon. Um, but so they were, uh, as I mentioned, pivotal in that battle. And as a uh, thank you, Aragorn, once he became king, he gifted them that forest that they lived in, the Druidan Forest, uh, forever, in perpetuity. Uh, they they dwelt in Druidon in the Fourth Age. So we had that uh, Battle of Sudden Flame. Uh, times were rocky. I'm not going to go through all the individual histories of these houses necessarily, but you cut to after the victorious War of Wrath at the end of the First Age. The Valar rewarded the tribes of men who fought and suffered alongside the elves against Morgoth. The House of Haleth was all but wiped out but the surviving members of the houses of Beor and Hador were granted the island of Numenor. And thus, we see the origin of the Numenorians. 
There's one more thing I want to touch on when it comes to these tribes, the Edine. There is a way in which all three houses are connected. It gets a little, <laughs> the names get a little fast and furious here, but I think it's important. It's interesting, but it's also really important to uh, Tolkien's mythology. So, Galdor of the house of Hador married Harith of the house of Holith. <laughs> Easy for me to say. But in any case, there was a member of the house of Holith that married a member of the house of Hador. They had two sons, two heroes, Hurin and Huor. It was Huor who married Rian of the house of Beor, and they had a son, Tuor. So Tuor represented the bloodlines of all three houses of the Edine. Right? His grandparents were of the house Hador and the house Haleth, and then his mom was of the house of Beor. So Tuor had Yarendil, incredibly famous, obviously, and Yarendil uh, had the twins uh, Elrond and Elros. So you could say that Elrond, uh, along with his elven blood, also had the blood of all three of the houses of the Edine. So, the blood of all three houses lives in that line. And with Elros, who was the first king of Numenor. All right, explaining the origin of the Edine is actually a fairly uh, action-packed segment there. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, cut this off, and I'm going to do a part two, where I'm going to describe the tribes that did not go to the west, uh, like the Easterlings and the Haradrim and the Northmen. So I'll do that in the next video, uh, some really interesting uh, mythological tidbits there. So uh, come back for that for part two. Uh, but thanks so much for uh, tuning in, everybody. And uh, if you've got a topic you'd like me to talk about, feel free to put it in the comments. I'd be happy to do a video about a topic of your choosing. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next time with part two of the Tribes of Men. Uh, thanks so much.